Hi there, uh, I'm Paul Forbes from RFS Advice uh, and I, we wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening in the markets at the moment. So today is the 23rd of April um, and we're seeing a little bit of volatility. So at the start of the year we actually were quite positive on markets because we actually thought that markets were looking reasonably valued. Uh, but we've actually had, already had a very, very strong quarter. So if you look at the first three months of the year, I think markets grew by over 9% just in that three months. So annualised, that's like 36%. But forgetting that, it just means what's happened to underlying prices grew pretty rapidly. Now, that then meant that even by the end of March uh, in here and probably uh, through the start of early April, um, we went. it's not a matter of being concerned, but it is actually a matter of being careful when you start seeing... Uh, prices grow as rapidly as they do, as they did, um, and f uh, fundamentally, what happens is there's a there's a bit of a psychology to it. So, markets look pricey, people start looking for any sort of negative um, uh, indicators, and we've got a few. All right. So, the first one we should probably, and we'll just do a bit. Of, I'm just going to run through a little quick umbrella of, of geopolitical events. And then what that means for energy, and then fundamentally what's also happening, what the other implications from interest rates. Um, so yes, we still have the Ukraine-Russian crisis going on. Um, that's put pressure on natural gas all over all over the world. Um, as well, of course, there's a, a lot of money being spent on uh, helping Ukraine defend itself from uh, Russia. Um, but most recently, the main major focus has been on the Israel and Iran conflict. So um, I won't go back into the history of it, you'll know the history of it, but the uh, most recently um, the Iranians were, had, had what you classed as probably a fairly concise attack on a, a building where they killed off a number of generals, Iranian generals. Um, Iran uh, felt they had to have a response to Israel and sent over 300 drones and arguably some ballistic missiles towards uh, Israel. Um, which the Israeli defence has managed to shoot down 99% of them. Um, that, that's a big escalation because uh, Iran historically has used its proxies, uh, things like Hezbollah and Hamas, to attack Israel. But this is the first time in a very long time we've seen a direct attack or um, a direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. Um, we have to remember Israel actually has nuclear weapons and Iran has a nuclear program, so that's that's probably what scares the market there. Um, the most most recently, Israel actually provided a fairly uh, precise attack once again in response to the Iranian um, escalation or the the Iranian um, uh, barrage and. What it looked like it was trying to do, and it's a, you know, this is purely speculation and listening to commentators, is between the two of them, it was more a, we can do this if we really have to. And both teams seem to have st stood back a little bit now and gone, you know what, do we want to actually escalate this any further? Um, the market would indicate that that now has softened a little bit. Now, in the process of doing that, when people were worried about a significant escalation, they immediately start thinking about, yes, there's a human tragedy in this, but also the impact more broadly on the world is it, this is a huge area in regard to oil exports and the world runs on diesel, so we need oil. Um, so if you look at the Red Sea, um, we've already got the Houthis actually causing drama in there um, and attacking ships. Um, but if, the, if there was a significant conflict with Iran, um, we are talking about the Straits of Hormuz, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but it's H-O-R-M-U-Z, um, which is a real choke point for, for movement of oil. So they call it the, the, the largest oil artery in the world. Um, and at one, at one area in the channel, is only, it's only three kilometres across. So you could see um, this would be a logical place if someone wanted to get particularly... Um, aggressive or have an impact on the world generally, they could try and blockade that particular area. Um, so that's why oil prices suddenly started going up. On top of that, um, yeah, there is a, um, because of the Houthis, more ships are now um, circumnavigating the long way around to avoid any potential conflicts, and this is adding to the cost of shipping. So there's that element of it which has now been reflected the pumps. Same story here in Australia, as soon as we start seeing any sort of increase in um, the cost of uh, cost of oil, 
um, then that has flow on effects every, with everything you buy. We're a big country, we move a lot of stuff around and we move it mainly on diesel. Uh, so whether it's trains, boats, um, cars, trucks, um, yeah, that's how we get things to and from places. So that there's you know, every incremental cost on that then gets passed through the consumer. So that was the first part of it. Um, if that softens again, we might see that pressure come off, which is good. So uh, we'd all like to think that there is been there is a de-escalation and both parties back away from any further aggression, um, and that would then indicate a softening in the, the demand for all the soft softening in the risk of a major oil supply issue. Um, as you come closer to home, so the so markets started to react to that, but they're actually probably more reacting to interest rates. Um, so fundamentally, um, there's been an expectation ever since COVID that inflationary pressures would ease, and therefore uh, interest rate pressure, um, the, fun, the uh, uh, fundamentally interest rates would be able to ease as well. Um, why is this good? Well, it's good for a whole range of reasons, obviously. Now, first off, for the consumer, it puts, you know, if you're, if you're paying less for your mortgage, that puts more money back in your pocket, um, which increase, increases uh, the ability for you to spend money on other things. Um, um, it does improve confidence as well. So uh, if, now, it's, it's sort of slightly, slightly odd in that if interest rates are easing, it would mean economies are slowing. Um, but it, the, the fundamental concern is economies are running too hot at the moment. Now, that was the hope. And so there was a whole range of interest rate um, uh, cuts built into uh, forecasts by, um, by analysts all around the world. Uh, those are slowly disappearing. Personally, and, and I'm not trying to be too clever on this, but I have been saying this since the start of the year, uh, I actually think the safest place to sit at the moment is if you think what, where interest rates are at the moment, it's probably going to be close to that when we get to the end of the year. Uh, there may be some slight softening in interest rates, but materially, um, we're just simply running too strong. The economies around the world are running quite healthily at the moment, um, and there isn't a fundamental reason to drop them. Uh, if inflation is still running around 4.7%, which is what it's doing at the moment, um, usually you use that as your building block before you add whatever premium you're going to get. So interest rates should be sitting around 7% if inflation's sitting at 5 So even if it drops to 35 to 4%, it should still be sitting around about 6%. So I, I think there seems to be a, some sort of optimism that we'd see interest rates back to that 2% which we saw uh, pre-COVID or um, during COVID. That was a false economy. You know, there was an enormous amount of government stimulus going into the market. Um, all of those things actually led to um, interest rates being held down to an unrealistic level. Interest rates should actually always be above inflation. Otherwise, why would you lend money to people? Uh, so, th so for me, that expectation is the safe bet for all, all investors out there is consider rates to be sitting pretty much where they are now at the end of the year, and you won't necessarily be disappointed. It's unlikely they'll rise, even though there is... Um, some potential for that, uh, but I don't think central banks around the, around the world would be particularly excited about a positive or an increase in rates. So if interest rates um, aren't dropping, then some of the built-in uh, some of those some of those um, built-in expectations um, from analysts uh, will be disappointing. Um, so cost of funds will remain where they are. Consumers won't have more money in their pocket to, to spend money. Uh, there would be, um, we'll continue to see uh, pressure on things like housing um, and um, more generally, you'll actually, you see a, a slowing down um, of, oh, sorry, a reduction in consumer confidence of what the future looks like for them. Um, the other thing which um, is it both is a good thing though, is that the unemployment rate is still running at 3.7%. So. Normally, to see a softening economy, you'd actually have to see higher levels of unemployment because people, um, the, a, the, the job market needs some sort of pressure. So, um, so employers can actually try and uh, constrain wages growth. Um, the only way they can do that is by a, a market where there's more uh, employees available. Uh, unlikely at the moment. So we're still seeing pretty strong jobs, um, jobs pressure. Our governments really aren't helping this at the moment, so this is both state and federal governments. Massive amount of projects going on out there. Um, if we look at Queensland, then, you know, there's some 
it's, it's pretty easy to, to go down that rabbit hole of why wages are increasing, but there's, there's a whole range of additional benefits offered to employees and government projects, which small business people and, and small projects simply can't afford. Uh, so that's, that's where those workers are going, but that's also putting pressure on wages growth because if you're a small, you're a small business and you're trying to retain staff, um, you're going to have to actually increase the benefits to those staff, which puts um, costs therefore on the additional costs of the projects, which then gets passed through to the consumer. So all that's sitting out there at the moment. All right. So where do we go from here? Um, markets are still pricey. So even sitting uh, where we are now, where there's been a slight softening, we're not particularly excited about where valuations are at the moment. Um, but if we actually do continue to see sustained growth in the economies, both here and the US, and the US is the one you've got to pay attention to, um, then you'd have to, you'd, then the expectation is earnings will actually improve, which then means that the, the current earnings projections um, are probably slightly understated. Now that's how we can actually see value in the markets. Um, the great news though is in the interim, we actually have pretty effective um, weapons for yield now. So, you know, when cash rates are running at 0.1%, it wasn't very exciting to sit in cash. When cash is now sitting at um, just under five, and you can turn deposits of higher than that, and you can get effective yields from some of the uh, underlying shares out there at higher levels than that, that gives us some good defensive assets uh, where we can actually have funds sit out um, what could be a very could be a relatively volatile time in the markets. Right. Hopefully that gives you some, some idea of what's happening out there. As all things, we don't like the crystal ball um, because you know, you, anyone who knows says they, say, well, says they know what's happening in the near future um, is almost inevitably wrong, so we stay away from that. So what we try and always do is have a, some diversity of assets. We build in shock absorbers within portfolios to take some of these shocks, um, and that allows us then to reposition the portfolios if there is a shock. Um, I had a client ask me the other day, you know, just, you know, what does this mean to my investments if the markets are going down? Well, it sort of means that investments drop. <laughs> um, but it comes down to they don't drop as much as the market. And you can then reposition to come back in and pick up better quality investments at cheaper prices. So if you're in the market, we never say run away from it. The analogy we've used for a long time, and I'll finish on this, is that... Um, the, the Titanic sank because it was running at full speed into an ice field. Right? What it should have been doing was slowing down. It thought it was indestructible and therefore um, the, you know, therefore was running at a far, far, past, far um, faster pace than uh, would, would have been even slightly um, realistic. All right, we, we might finish on this because this is an analogy we've used in the past and I think it's one a good visual people for people to think about. Um, people talk about the Titanic and the, obviously the, there was a belief in the Titanic that they're indestructible. We, we don't believe that. Uh, but you still have to get from A to B. And the Titanic, if it had slowed down and been more careful because there were my, more iceberg, icebergs around, uh, could have still navigated its way through uh, that ice field without necessarily sinking the ship. Um, that's how we have to think about things. When you start seeing more and more icebergs in the water, you have to slow the ship down. That's where we put defensive measures in place. Uh, and that's how we navigate our way through here. But we can't lose sight of what our destination is. Right? So if you've got any concern, concerns at all, please talk to us. Um, but understand that we do take these things into account. And that's, there's active um, asset re repositioning going on behind the scenes. Um, which will help with this. Doesn't always. It doesn't complete, completely, uh, never, never completely negates it, but it certainly can ease some of that pressure and leave you in a better, better position to take advantage of the upside when it eventually comes. Markets do this.